I welcome uh, all of you to our next panel. It's on technology uh, transforming enterprises, and we have our esteemed set of panelists. Uh, can we have a brief introduction? Sure. Hello. Uh, thanks for hosting us here. So my name is Harish. I'm the senior VP of engineering uh, at Aqua Technologies. Hi everyone. I'm Aditya. I'm the founder and CEO for Centralytics. Uh, we're a product and services company, so hopefully we'll talk about tech today. Good afternoon. I am Jagannathan, uh, Associate Vice President from Hitachi Systems. I appreciate you for being here. We are standing between you and lunch. All right. Uh, I'll begin with a common question to all of you. You know, uh, we are seeing technologies, uh, blockchain, AI, ML, you know. How these technologies are reshaping traditional business models and becoming a core requirement for uh, businesses these days? I'll answer this in maybe two parts. What we are doing internally in the IT systems and what we are doing for our customers. Uh, when we took out this journey of multiple new technologies, right, from cloud and all that, um, obviously, uh, right balanced decision has to be taken. So we kind of uh, looked at it. Uh, and then look at which are the ones that has to go to cloud. So those that were customer facing uh, was decided to be taken to cloud. It makes sense for the simple fact that scalability was a requirement, reliability was one and availability. And then when it came to internal, uh, again there was kind of uh, study done to find out which are the ones that are across the organization, across users, which are departmental ones, uh, stuff like that. So then whatever was company-wide uh, again in the cloud. Uh, so either uh, SaaS based or a cloud provider once. And whatever is more departmental, only use, we're still in, are still in rather uh, on provider. Right? So we were able to achieve a combination of uh, adoption of new technology and the existing ones. Uh, thereby, whatever is needed for business and from cost, we were able to achieve. Now, coming to the second side of uh, the other technologies, what we're doing for customers, um, because Hitachi brings in both combination of IT and OT. We are more than a, uh, more than a century old uh, conglomerate, both in IT and OT. So for a state uh, police force, what we're doing is um, helping them to identify uh, suspicious objects uh, and also to predict uh, uh, the protests. So why this becomes important is, um, uh, especially a protest one, if uh, computer vision is picking up a, a set of data from uh, metro entrance or exit, that is not a protest. There has to be a better way of really knowing which is a protest. Uh, that is something that is built by the AI ML algorithm. That is something that we are kind of doing. Second stuff when it comes to IoT related because AI ML is more on vibration analytics. What you are doing there is uh, helping a lot of uh, uh, municipal corporations which hand with water uh, and also the garbage trucks, right? Uh, somewhere we have to find out uh, the optimum level of uh, weight being carried by these. Uh, that is something that we are doing when it comes to uh, IoT related, where we leverage on sensors and all. Those are the things that we are doing. Yeah, so I think technology has become a key enabler to scale. Um, I believe if you're running a small uh, setup, right, I mean, I'll take the example of a retail store. Um, you don't need a lot of technology per se, or you couldn't have a lot of technology per se, because let's say you want to build your own POS system, it's not cost effective. If you want to do your own inventory management, it's not cost effective. So you're forced to use non-digital uh, methods, right, from your ledgers, to your uh, Excel, to your pieces of paper. Now, what happens is when you have a POS being built centrally by a company out there and it's being sold to millions of customers, all automatically it becomes much more cost effective. So now that same retail store can not only procure that technology and that application at a sustainable cost, but he or she can now think about opening three more stores knowing that you know, their core business is very well digitally enabled. So I think technology has become the key enabler behind anything that has to scale. Uh, beyond beyond technology, there is no scale. So, uh, to me, that's what it has done to, to modern day businesses. Harish, uh, I would ask you, you know, do you want to answer this or? 
Yeah, partially yes. Uh, so I think you asked a question that had three or four parts to it. Right? One was blockchain, it was IoT. Third was I think the AI. Fourth is the ML part. Uh, so as an insurer, uh, I go. Uh, again, people read a lot into IoT. It's very device in intensive. People talk about, for example, vehicle analytics, etc. But there is a practical angle to building technology. I think we tend to forget that. Uh, people generally jump into technology bandwagon because it's new, because it's shiny. For example, there are a lot of proxies that we have to consider when building a particular technology, right? In the it has to make sense to the masses. So we have to follow where the customers are going and not because there is a technology. You know? It's not like you have a nail and you're looking for a wall to, uh, you know, put it in, right? So, Taco, for example, you need a lot of data before you can even imagine a AIML uh, project. Data is extremely, extremely important, right? So today we do, for example, uh, dynamic pricing for uh, automobiles, for uh, say biking cars. For that you need a large amount of data to understand all the nuances of a particular customer to be able to give them the right price depending on multiple factors, age of the vehicle, where you are driving it, how long has it been, are you the first owner, second owner, what has been your previous claims history, etc, etc. There's an enormous amount of data that, has, that does go in before you can even attempt it. Uh, similarly, on IoT, for example, there are proxies on, uh, say, behavior that can actually tell you without the device itself, right? Uh, so, do you live, for example, in an area where there is a, a high probability of floods? You don't need an IoT device to tell you that, right? There is demographic data, there is geographical data that can actually tell you that. Similarly, so blockchain also, for example, you need to know whether that non depredation kind of a record keeping is really relevant for you or not. Uh, whether you can afford the cost of having such a system, right? Whether that particular record keeping system needs to be decentralized or not. So I believe that uh, in the in the context of how businesses are shaping up in India, uh, probably AIML will take a, a leap, uh, you know, because of course there is there is uh, adoption of other technologies too. But here, because uh, in India we generate a lot of data simply because there is enough uh, population, you know, which is transacting, interacting. Our internet consumer base is enormously high. So I think companies will leverage, have to leverage. Uh, that amount of data, of course, they need to do good by the customer, you know, and not use the data for what it is not intended to do. I think that uh, that uh, that amount of responsibility has to be there in the, in the, with the companies when they collect that particular data. But I think there is enough quantum of data, there is enough threshold uh, where these two technologies, I believe, will uh, you know be adopted to much larger scale than where we are today. If we take linguistics itself, for example, you, you cannot have English as one solve for everybody, right? There are at least 25 major languages that are spoken in, in India, right? So can there be a LLM model that can work, say, for example, for Kannada, Marathi and Telugu together? It's a very difficult question to ask, it's a very difficult question to also answer. But I think we generate enough data where, for example, the grammar to all these languages is almost the same. So investing here and as industries move towards you know, using this, I think India has a very pivotal role to play. And I believe that companies will invest more into it. For example, Aqua is investing into this. Uh, I think more companies will invest. That is a area that people, entrepreneurs, etc., especially, have to keep an eye on as to what's happening there. So, so that means uh, businesses need to adopt these technologies. Uh, uh, what about what's your uh, thought about you know? Uh, do these technologies bring efficiencies and business optimization? Absolutely, right. I mean, the paradox is that sometimes people think technology will replace people. I, I don't think that at all. I think people work with people, for people, alongside people. So I don't see how technology replaces people in any way, but I see them becoming more and more efficient. So if somebody was doing something in, in a day to day, technology will help us to do it in six hours, then four hours, then maybe one minute. But that doesn't replace the people element at all. So it's all about efficiencies, optimization, specialization. What technology will force us to do, it will force us to become experts in individual fields, right? It will force us to get very core domain oriented that this is what I know, this is what I do and nobody does this better than I can, right? So that by default creates a lot of other challenges. How do companies, uh, you know, operationally hire roles that may not have, you know, that much capacity planning needed or how do you mitigate the risk of uh, these technologies sort of becoming expensive or over going overboard as far as their usage is concerned. So there are other risks that come with it for sure, but at its core, all that any technology can do is bring efficiency. It cannot actually replace the outcome. Yeah, I may will take that. It's a very relevant, important question, pertinent question to answer right now, right? So there are three parts to this answer. Part number one is, is technology bringing in efficiency? The answer to that is you have to ask where is it bringing efficiency? 
Number two, who does this allow us to to do something which was which was not possible before? That's the second part to that answer. The third part of this is the human factor to this. So maybe we'll answer them in three parts. So the first part to this, uh, of course, is yes, it brings in efficiency. Efficiency means uh, using less people to do the same kind of job. It's not just people; it's also less systems. For example, what AS400 did 20 years ago, today a mobile phone does it. It means that the mobile phone replaces an AS400 to a large degree, right? So it's not just people that is getting uh, that 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 is affected. It's also the systems, the kind of systems that we build. Uh, and I can give Apple as an example simply because so today, if you want, if you're we're a D2C brand, right? We're a direct to consumer brand for insurance. People come directly to us. Our product is the face of or to to the customer. We want our product to build that kind of trust with the customer, right? Because there's no agent in between who's selling the product to you. You come to Apple, you look at Apple and say, Hey, here, do I trust this insurance company with with my money? Will they do good by me whenever the need arises? So building trust in this particular system, how does technology help us? You know, how, how can we leverage it, right? If you look at, for example, buying a health insurance, how do we ensure that the customer is guided appropriately? Right? The customer is here, the customer probably doesn't understand much on the nuances of buying an insurance. How do you guide the customer in a way that you know you tell them, hey, do we get the right kind of information? Do we uh, do we take the customer to the right uh, sales motion, you know, where they understand what they need? Do I need uh, X? Uh, versus a, a Y kind of a, 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 you know an, an insurance uh, amount. Uh, hey, what about my dependents? My parents are living somewhere else outside. What is the right kind of a construct for me? Typically, this can only be solved by technology, right? Understanding where you are, your customer context, gathering the right kind of data, and solving for it real time, right? Somebody could say, hey, I'm I'm all okay, but hey, I'm diabetic, for example, right? Uh, so what happens? Can the system automatically understand the context? And switch to a solution that is good for that particular customer. This is bringing efficiency. In the older days, this used to be a 15-day process. You know, somebody applies, the clerk takes it, uh, does everything else, goes through some medical test. Who that is about another 10 days. Comes back, looks at it, and says, "Oh, this HbA1c, oh, this is very high." Goes back again, reproposes the customer. Customer comes back again. So this is a 15-day process. Today, on our site or the app, this is a 15-minute process. This is bringing efficiency absolutely, but what is it solving for? It's actually solving for the customer. It's not solving for the office that does it. The office exactly does the same things today. The amount of risk that an insurer carries is the same. That's not changing. What is changing is that the consumer can make that decision right now. We're buying life insurance, for example, which we launched about 15 years ago. Uh, so how do I know how much cover do I need? Am I overinsured? Am I paying too much money, or am I underinsured? You know that the quality of life of my family will change just because. I didn't know how much to buy. So how do we ensure that the customer is guided appropriately? There are systems today that are built, and technology is the major player here. We use ML models today, for example, to suggest the right kind of uh, cover for the particular customer. That's answering the efficiency question. Coming to the other side of the efficiency question is in the in the service motion. You always think about sales, 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 right? Efficiency. No, there's a lot of uh, efficiency to be built even in the service motion. Service motion means when a customer comes in. Comes for claims, for example. Think about a scenario where you are in the hospital, somebody is undergoing a surgery, uh, and then you know you are at a desk saying, "Hey, I have insurance." You know, blah. Today, that is there's a lot of friction in the system. You go to the desk, you give it, he will call the doctor, you call the insurer, he will say it's discovered, not covered, blah. Somebody will ask more questions. You will say, "Hey, that report is missing." How do we, for example, do auto adjudication today? It's a very large uh, problem to solve. A lot of companies are solving it, including Echo. So, how do I ensure that the, the the document submitted by the customer on the spot is analyzed by systems today? We use, for example, uh, AI systems to understand. Hey, you you applied, for example, for an appendicitis operation. Is that being done? Is that the treatment? You know, is that the right kind of medicines given to you? Can I tell you at the desk? And even on the email desk at some point in time, right? To say, hey, just come tell me what has happened. Here are the five documents. Send it to us. And then we'll tell you what has happened. Today we do instant claim management, which is in matter of minutes. You are at the hospital, not trying to work with the insurer. At the hospital, trying to get somebody get well soon. So how can we solve for the customer? I think that's the key angle to look at. You know, when we talk about all these technologies, not for the sake of okay, it's there. Let's build something shiny on top of it because it solves a particular customer problem, right? So auto education is a very big example on on what we are working. I think similar systems, you know, not only in insurance, in fintech, there is going to have to be loan dispersal. Right? It could be something else. How I think companies will invest, have to invest, and solve for the for the customer, you know, consumer first. The third angle to this is the people angle that we talked about. Right? Um, There's a popular saying going on nowadays to say the calculator didn't replace the accountant. 
it replaces the accountant, you didn't know how to use it, right? So I think we should apply that <laughs> sort of a proverbial thing across the industry today. There will be new systems that will guide people, for example, to do their job better. If you look at, for example, Copilot, I don't know if there are engineers here in the room and if they've used it, if what, what used to take about, say, on an average three hours to build a service, to build something you don't figure out, oh, this data model, what do we do, goes to a stack workflow, looks at something else, comes back, you know, Google something else, looks at some old bit report. Today, that entire three hour process has come down to about 10 minutes. You know, you have add Copilot to it, you know, you check in your repo, now the system understands what you're coding, it will tell you, hey, this structure, you know, you have to use this. Oh, you're trying to make a service call, the boilerplate code is here. So people who know what to do, do it very efficiently. So I think it's not going to replace people. I think we need a large retraining philosophy in the industry. And if you look at the 80s where computerization itself, you know, was a big thing. People moved from offline accounting to online accounting. We had this entire, I don't know, the generation that was data operators, right? People who said, oh, do you know how to use a computer, data operator? I think that generation saw that shift. From there, then we moved to, for example, cloud, where people said, oh, I don't have an on-premise. How do I spin up, for example, something else? How do I talk to a Lambda or AWS, for example, right? That's the people shift. The third most important shift, I think, right now is going to happen is where tools, technologies will get built on top of this very large and powerful, you know, AI models. People have to adapt to it. So retraining the organization is needed. You know, the people need to think differently. Management needs to think differently. And you need to have a long-term investment to make it happen. I think we have to look at this in, in three phases of, of both the efficiency angle to it, the people angle to it, and new use cases that are getting built on top of it that was not possible before. Jagannath, do you want to add something? Primarily what my take is, uh, obviously adding to what Harish and uh, the gentleman told us, it directly contributes to customer side of things, where it could be on our um, experiences or for a company to get more revenues and um, profitability. Second side is on the operations, uh, again, more primarily focused on internal side of things, bringing in that efficiency. Can I do things faster? Uh, can I automate a lot of things? I only hand out 10% of decision making to a person, but 80% my system would automate and give that what is needed for the person to take decision. The third element is on the risk. How much can I reduce the risk on certain things? Especially this comes, comes into play uh, on say fraud analytics especially for banks. Uh, is this transaction genuine based on a location, based on the person's profile and all that, right? I think these are the areas that directly impacts the business. Uh, that's what I feel. All right, we talked about, you know, uh, the benefits these technologies bring. Uh, what are the challenges you uh, think these uh, technologies have, you know, while implement implementation? I think the biggest uh, challenge that I see is, uh, you know, our ability to unlearn and relearn um, these new technologies. I think Harish touched upon it as well, right? It's about knowing how to use the calculator. I was having this interesting conversation where uh, somebody was saying that, oh, now the new generation might not even know how to, uh, you know, do tables. The point is they don't need to, right? I mean, that's the basic difference that comes generation after generation uh, is you may not need to know things because it's completely outdated, completely redundant. So one biggest challenge will be how do we keep up with the change, right? And uh, unlearn and relearn how to do the same thing, but just a different way. Uh, the second major challenge that we see is obviously the risks that technologies bring, right? There's a lot of conversation around security. There's a lot of conversation around cost. There's a lot of conversations around performance. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, there are always two sides to the same coin. So uh, we always have to make sure that the good will be more than the bad out of it. And obviously it also creates opportunity because if we create some problems, somebody else will come and solve those problems. So uh, certainly it's gonna be a new world. And I think the best part is if we add um, AI plus IoT plus 5G together, I just can't imagine that, you know, I, I feel like um, we, this generation will see Iron Man movies become a reality, right? I mean, VR is going to become real, AR is going to become real. So we just have to be ready to accept it. I think that's the biggest challenge is our own ability to accept that reality and be willing to move into that reality uh, is, is how I would see it. My take is um, it's broadly when the company itself is founded, right? And second is, uh, what is the kind of digital trust uh, that particular organization has? 
And third element is what is the level of uh, technical debt it can. Um, so combination of these throws up as a challenge. Now, uh, to make it as a simple analogy, which we can relate easily is um, phone users, we can categorize them into three. One is a landline user, maybe our fathers and grandfathers. Second is your basic feature phone era, where there are only button phones. Right? And third is the smartphone era. If you look at what is happening around us, our kids are far super duper in the way they are using smartphones, sometimes better than what we are doing, right? So that is a better level of adoption. Relating that to a startup which kind of came in a couple of years back or less than five years, ten years, they take up these technologies really well, right? The second set is the basic feature phone uh, people. They are slowly moving to the smartphone adoption. They do what is essential for them on a smartphone, such as organizations that are trying a blend of technology. They still carry some legacy system, and then they kind of modernize some set of applications, and then um, pick up new, they are in that journey. And the landline kind of a, a category people, there are still companies that are legacy system. They struggle because the technical debt is so high for them, they are struggling to move to the next levels. Uh, that would be a hard journey for them, but with the kind of uh, uh, benefits that they see around, uh, they would take a, a step forward somewhere, break the jinx and take the step forward. Yeah, I, again, um, when we say challenges, uh, we should look at it as an opportunity. Of course, every opportunity has a challenge, right? You have to adapt to it. So there are, if you look at the entire industry, uh, there are companies that are well established. For them, it's a matter of lack of better word survival. Right? There are companies that are already there, not too old. Uh, for them, it's a matter of growth. And the third kind of companies are companies that are not been born yet. For for whom it's an opportunity. So we should look at it. We should look at the challenge. If you look at it that way. I would use the word opportunity rather than challenge. For all these three. For example, today, like I said, if you if you consider uh, a company that does not adopt to any of these technologies, only one or more of them, which is relevant to, the, to their particular industry, it becomes a matter of uh, survival for them, right? Um, let's say there's a like I don't know, there is a company that still does a lot of manual processing where you have to go to the customer, come to the customer, do it. Uh, they would find a lot of trouble, you know, keeping up with companies that don't do it. Like today, for example, people use eKYC. Like an actor uses eKYC, it gets done in less than a minute if you have the, the documents with you, right? Imagine that versus somebody who says, I'm going to send somebody home, then you have to call him up, then he will come, then my get entry, then he comes in, blah. The entire motion around that is going to be so frictionful, right? So companies that have to look at transforming using this technology, it could be AI, it could be IoT, it could be whatever, right? Even cloud company, a lot of companies are not even there yet, right? So for them, it's a generational shift. Uh, for, so for those companies, the challenges are going to be around how does their core business get protected by shifting to these technologies. They don't do it, it's a matter of survival for them. They will have to, however big or small the company is, they will end up, you know, they will have to do this. Today there are kiosks, I don't know, there's one in Bangalore, one in Hyderabad also, where you could just walk into the kiosk, kiosk fit by yourself, there is a prick that it does and it gives you your health report in about half an hour. Imagine that versus a traditional, uh, say, diagnostic center. We have to go in the morning, fasting, sit there, you know, do something, then go back, eat or idli, come back, sit there again, some doctor will come, whatever. It's a one-day process. So that industry, for example, could be very easily disrupted by this. Why? Because for them, it's a matter of saying, hey, how can I shift to this particular technology slash platform slash tools as they come up with? So part one is, there is a challenge for companies where it's a matter of survival, right? they have to do this transformation on the ship. There's no other way out for them. The second piece is for companies that need growth. Simple example, today SEO, everybody who does d c knows what SEO is, right? Essentially ensuring Google that you're on the top. SEO has or is changing drastically with generational AI. Today, companies can spin up, I don't know, enormous amount of SEO content pages, a matter of minutes. And you don't need content writers to sit and write to bring your company onto the top. That's a matter of growth for companies that are doing DTC today, right? So for them, we need to understand and leverage this. Google itself has to make changes to ensure that this, lack of better word, robot-generated content, you know, is, is not putting companies that really don't do anything on top of it, right? So both the infrastructure players and the, the, the content players have to change. 
So here it's a matter of growth, right? D2C is becoming much larger because customers trust these brands right now. So today, I mean, 15 years ago, you couldn't imagine a person saying, some website, pay 1 lakh rupees, they send you a phone home. I don't think anybody in the audience would have done that. But today people buy like an iPhone on Flipkart and Amazon. You trust them to say, okay, why well, gave 1 lakh rupees? I'm sure two days I'm going to get the phone. So trust on this infrastructure is moving. Basically, infrastructure is fueled by technology, right? So that trust, it's a matter of, of, of growth for companies that are already there. But the biggest opportunity slash challenge for me is companies that are not being born yet. Right? Like, like nobody thought about e-commerce 20 years ago, right? Nobody thought about, you know, 50 things online. Nobody thought about, thought about Zepto, for example, right? Yeah, I'm sitting at home, Acha, I miss something I do, and by the time I'm doing the tarka, it's already here. So that quick commerce, whatever, it's happening everywhere. Across insurance industries also, for example. Like, like for example, in terms of actor today, I know people where you look at the police or you figure out your insurance is expired, just stop your car, buy the insurance and go there. That would not have been possible 15, 20 years ago. So these companies will be born, who will be leverage this particular technology, right? And solve use cases that are not being seen yet. So again, if you look at it as a challenge, yes, the challenge is to reach to an opportunity and it will involve rescaling of people, it will involve rethinking of systems, right? Um, for example, edge computing with AI will change a lot, like Apple is doing today. You can do a lot of what you do on the phone, for which you needed a Photoshop 10 years ago. Right? So that technology has moved from being uh, heavily compute intensive or to being on the edge. So that, that shift has happened. Right? So I think we'll all sort of get there. So we need to look at the, the chasm, which is the challenge to get that particular opportunity. I think it will work in all these three things. New entrepreneurs have to make uh, you know, that thinking process, get it right. Look at where they need to help for survival. Companies will get built there. Uh, where they need to, for example, look at fueling growth and where, for example, to build something new that's not existing so far. All right. We are short of time, so we'll take uh, some questions, one or two, uh, audience, uh, if there's any. Hi. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the uh, information that shared. As you rightly suggested, companies which are not yet born, maybe startups have a definite potential to change whatever is not seen. For example, AWS in India is not well known. Also EKYC which Echo has bought. So I am also trying to do similar to EKYC where you flash your Aadhaar card using optical card reader you can easily uh, do your EKYC. Why there are so much uh, companies not coming forward to these kind of uh, technologies implemented as a startup? Any suggestions from your end? How uh, we as startups can uh, think over these kind of innovative ideas? I don't know if the question is for me or yeah, sure. Thank you. I mean, I'll let others also opinion on this. See, it's a. Uh, I mean, if you're in a regulated environment, right? Like insurance, fintech, banking, uh, KYC, where you handle a lot of PII data, right? Personal data. Uh, there is a particular friction, you know, to build a startup, right? Because you need to be compliant on 50 different things. You need to ensure that you store the data right. So you need to understand, for example, how to store, especially working with Aadhaar, for instance, right? Uh, uh, how to store the data, how to transmit the data securely, how to keep it. You need a amount of depth, you know, to, to build companies that specifically are working in that area very pointedly that you're asking EKYC or A lot of companies who are doing this, for example, right? So not just KYC, if you look at, um, say, uh, uh, existence check, as we call it today, how do I ensure that you're living? If you buy buying a life policy, I need to be sure that you are living, right? So that you know you don't fraud me. So I will ask the customer to blink. I'll ask the customer to say a sentence. So tech companies are getting building there. I think it's a matter of race, you know. It's a matter of somebody committing to this. A startup has to commit to this to say I'm going to do this. Study the market, and then look at the technology available to it and build it. It's not very difficult to build it. I'm assuming it's just a matter of commitment that somebody has to put in, right? And if you need a longer conversation, I don't know, you could talk offline. Uh, but in, in, to sum it up. You need commitment to do this. It's a regulated field, so you need to understand the regulations very well. You need to have the depth to, to do that. Number three is you're handling very sensitive customer data, right? You're handling other data, you're handling, for example, name, address, email, phone number, maybe credit card, whatever, etc. So you need to really do good by there. And number three is you need to know what technology to, to leverage. See, tech is not the solve. The solve is solving for the KYC of the customer. Let's say somebody says, my other is not visible. The photo is not visible at all. What do you do? Right? So you can't say, oh, sorry, this tech is not working now. I can't do OCR reader. So I'll send somebody home. Then you're losing the plot, right? 
So how do you know how far you can push your technology to make that use case happen? I think that's critical. Right? So I think there's an opportunity. A lot of companies are doing this. If you're doing this, fantastic. You know, appreciate that. Hello. We are short of time. One, one question. All right. My name is Virat Shetty. I'm so sorry. Uh, my name is Virat Shetty. I'm from Prevalent Automotive. Uh, wishing everyone uh, uh, happy Women's Day and also happy Shivratri. Um, so my question is to Mr. Aditya. Sir, what would be the scope of technological advancement in softwares like ERP or management softwares where we can increase the production rates and also monitor on the transportation dispatch and also the production lines? That's a great question. I've actually been uh, thinking about this because internally we have like seven different management softwares from CRM, ERPs, uh, HRMS, ITSM and one day I was thinking, yeah, what the hell? I mean, all these management softwares are basically there for people to punch data instead of working. And uh, I was actually thinking what would be the solution to this and I think the answer lies in completely reversing the story, right? So co-pilots and uh, GPTs are great examples where I think there, I don't think these systems will go away, but I see some type of an interface that sits on top, which is sort of like my partner telling me what am I supposed to do? So imagine as a sales guy, instead of me punching in opportunities every day, uh, the system is prompting me that, hey, you're supposed to follow up with this customer, right? Imagine if I'm able to write my notes there and is recommending to me that why don't you go ahead and follow up with them on these days, I'll put an actionable for you on your calendar, right? So, so I completely see these management systems completely transforming into partnerships in the process. And I think that's a key area of opportunity that you'll see because if you look at these companies, they're all really, really in the legacy phase as uh, Harish mentioned. Now that can become an opportunity for them and they are investing. Salesforce has put together a fantastic AI team. I know SAP is investing in that direction, but it also becomes an opportunity for the not yet born startups because if somebody can come and disrupt that space, completely pivot the way we work, right? Make it not a management system system where I'm creating and punching data for my bosses to see, but more of an enablement system that actually lets me do my job while creating the data that my management wants. That will completely flip the use case. Today, I think the hardest adoption is of these management systems because everybody sees it as an annoyance. I'm not getting any help back. I'm just punching data so that somebody can create a report that can then go to somebody in the process. It doesn't really add value back to me, the person who's actually using that system. So. That's to me a very key gap that I would love to see a startup come in and actually fulfill.